I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind at home. Delighted to welcome to the program today, Sarah Kenzior, author of Hiding in Plain Sight. Welcome, Sarah. Oh, thank you for having me. And I hope you're staying safe and healthy and vibrant in, in Missouri, right? Yeah, as, as much as can be expected. So. so, you know, you've written extensively and precociously about the threat of authoritarianism at home. Mm -hmm. How acute is your concern at this juncture as we anticipate the fall campaign and the November election? Um, I'm very worried. I've been worried uh, from the moment Trump launched his campaign because I believed he would win and that once he won, he would rule in a manner reminiscent of a uh, Central Asian or, or former Soviet autocrat, um, a kleptocrat principally. That's what he's done. He's packed his cabinet with people whose explicit goal is to, as Bannon put it, dismantle the administrative state. He's put our country in danger. Uh, he has purged agencies. He has packed courts. He has eliminated oversight and ethics from government. And that extends into the election. Um, you know, its integrity was always in question. We have domestic voter suppression, foreign interference, insecure machines, and a new fear, which is that, you know, assume the election is held in assuming the Democrat wins, uh, Trump will simply refuse to leave. Your thesis in part all along has been the kleptocracy, the authoritarianism, the autocracy has been plain to view and we have gradually become desensitized to this decline because it's been the American status quo. And this is the culmination of that decades long drought of moral leadership. Um, so the immediate question amid the pandemic and these circumstances is what is the roadmap to recovering our democratic ethos and our core? It's going to be very difficult. I don't even necessarily assume I'll see it um, remedied in my lifetime, but I do think that the starting point is truth. It's brutal honesty about how we got to this point, about events in American history that led us here, uh, especially uh, you know corruption over the last 40 years, the erosion of the social safety net, um, you know, broad uh, assaults on democracy, whether the illicit war in Iraq or the financial crisis after which you know no one was really punished. Um, that lack of accountability greatly hurt us. On top of that, you have everything that the Trump administration has done, which a lot of times people view as so outrageous or just chaotic, or he just blundered his way in there. They don't see it as deliberate, and they don't notice the continuity, that it's often the very same bad political actors of the last 40 years, whether Bill Barr or Roger Stone or Paul Manafort or Trump himself, that are involved in this. So we need to have a very frank open discussion and there needs to be actual legal consequences because those are the only kind of consequences that this group of criminals recognize and then i do think in a way that we can move forward is that roadmap legal accountability and if so in the current environment in which our supreme court just recently ruled in favor of governor uh, christie's political aides who said in an email they wanted to threaten the health of a neighboring community because it was under the administration of a democratic opposing mayor. Our United States Supreme Court ruled unanimously, liberal, conservative, democratic, and Republican appointees that because there was no bribe in the form of quid pro quo with respect to land or dollars, that corruption isn't corruption. And that's a reality that any new administration can either accept or abandon. But we have an entire body of a Supreme Court that unanimously said corruption is okay um, as long as there is not a legal transfer, illegal transfer of dollars and cents. Every other kind of corruption to deprive ventilators to communities because they have Democratic mayors to deprive state funding because there's a Democratic governor. That isn't corruption. It's, that's the America we're living in today. Yes, it is. And actually, in my book, In Hiding in Plain Sight, um, I wrote about that same phenomenon in Missouri, I, where I live. I wrote about Missouri as the bellwether of American decline. And one of the things I brought up 
were, uh, you know, legal studies from about a decade ago saying that even quid pro quo corruption has no meaning here, that we essentially live in a lawless land in the wild Midwest. And now that kind of corruption that kind of entrenched criminality within the court system in which those with power and money can get away with almost anything, that is the, uh, you know, the way of, of the land. You see it in so many states. It's not universal. Uh, it's not completely consolidated, but it is the ideal situation for people involved in white collar crime, organized crime, money laundering, or for political parties like the GOP uh, who embrace dark money and who seek uh, not democracy, but in a one party state and they'll use whatever means to get there. So yes, I'm very worried about the court system, but I think um, some of the problem is that, you know, there's been a reluctance among officials to admit that this is happening. You know, we heard over and over again, Mueller's got it, Comey's got it, Congress and you know, Pelosi and the House have got it. Uh, then it's the 2020 election will save us. Whereas we really have a systematic breakdown and we need to admit that that has happened and that, you know, they're, they're just not. And I think it's because they're so humiliated by this institutional failure and by maybe not being on the ball, uh, you know, when all of these trends started by thinking everything was okay. That unfortunately is what allowed it to happen. And often these are not malicious actors. These are people who did not want this outcome, uh, but they underestimated the threat and we are all suffering for it. And so I wish everyone would just kind of come clean, you know, and call them out and name names. And they did name names in your home state with respect to the recent, uh, recently ousted governor. You know, he was involved in a corruption scandal that I want you to share with our audience and basically tell us whether or not he hid in plain sight with immunity, um, with impunity or with immunity. <laughs> <laughs> did, he, did he did he did he get away with it because it seems like he partially did and partially didn't yeah uh you're referring to eric Greitens, so let's see what the uh, the rating is for your program here because it's fairly salacious uh eric Greitens was the governor of missouri uh he ran as this sort of you know contrived redneck Missouri persona. In reality, he's a Rhodes Scholar who lived in a mansion and, you know, was using the GOP to get into political power. Uh, once in power, he was involved in a lot of shady activity. He tied a woman up uh, in his basement and photographed her half naked and blackmailed her. He had a system, an app, where he would delete uh, emails, including state documents. He was involved in a number of uh, financial fraud, uh, including stealing from veterans groups, um, you know, a lot of which went back to his campaign. Some of his campaign officials are, are greatly tied to the Trump administration, especially to Mike Pence. Um, you know, and so he was indicted. He was indicted a couple times. And this was back in 2018. And what was remarkable at the time and the big fear of everyone in Missouri is that he just refused to leave, you know, and the Republicans even in Missouri were pressuring him. They were like, you know, you've got to go, like you have committed crimes. And what appears to have happened, although I can't completely vouch for this, is that some sort of deal was struck where he wasn't going to be actually prosecuted or incarcerated, but he, he stepped down. Uh, and so now we have a, uh, a new governor, uh, one who's not handling the coronavirus pandemic well, but to my knowledge, he's never tied up a woman in his basement, so points to him, I guess. But yeah, it was a real example of the kind of fear that this unbridled corruption, particularly when our state corruption is linked to uh, national corruption within the Trump administration, where Greitens was seen as someone who could potentially be you know, the vice president or the president of the United States. That's very frightening. And right now, um, you know, he's planning his political comeback. And because there's no consequences for this kind of behavior, I could see that happening over the next couple of years. So what was the ingredient, though, for that pressure to be institutionalized in a sense that there was a check with respect to his administration of the state and Republicans were ultimately fed up enough? It, the, the mainstream coverage seemed to suggest there was a personality issue as much as there was malfeasance. But I'm just wondering if, if your example in Missouri, as you say, uh, is is the laboratory of democracy dysfunction correction course what what clicked with those legislators to say corruption is not partisan unless it's only being committed by one side right corruption is antithetical to our constitutional values 
on a state and federal level. So what clicked with those legislators that hasn't clicked with the Susan Collins and rest of the Republican, Rob Portman, others who came into their Senate tenures with, a, with an aura and, and something of a reputation for accountability and have just dropped the ball so utterly? Yeah, that's a great question. And I sometimes wonder if this scandal were occurring now, you know, in 2020 versus in 2018, where we've had such a further erosion of accountability, such flagrant uh, criminality, you know, as described during the impeachment hearings and otherwise, whether maybe Bryan's would still be around. Maybe the Republicans wouldn't push so hard nowadays. Um, you know, back then it, it was a few things. Uh, the Missouri Republican Party isn't a monolith. Uh, you know, during the primary, it was kind of split between Trump and Ted Cruz. And there are a lot of, you know, fundamentalist Christians who, who found Trump, uh, you know, fairly repulsive. Eventually, they kind of signed on. Um, and I think they had that same attitude about Greitens, that this was just like, ugh. you know, they weren't as bothered, um, you know, in, in a moral sense by the financial stuff. It was the, the sex related stuff, I think that was getting to them. Um, but I think mostly, you know, it was it was his campaign team. I think it was the fact that if Greitens were to be brought to trial, a lot of revelations about where he got his money and about the dark money system of Missouri that, that fuels our politics would be revealed uh, to, you know, to Missourians as we cast our vote. And we are a state that has been trying to get uh, dirty money out of politics for a long time. They passed an initiative, uh, voters did, in 2018 about Clean Missouri that was supposed to stop these kind of pernicious political practices. It's now, of course, being struck down by, uh, by the Republican government. But I think that that's where the leverage is. The leverage is in following the money. It's in exposing the corruption. It's in exposing the way uh, that con artists and grifters dominate our government. Because I do think that people will vote for a lot of bad things. They will vote for a bigot. They will vote for people who will shatter the, the social safety net. What they don't want to vote for is someone who's going to steal their money. No one likes a kleptocrat. No one likes to be fooled. That is what Brighton's was. That is what Trump is. And I think that if the Democrats or any opponent of Trump hammered that home, that this guy is a, is a criminal who's taking your money, I mean, who, who the hell wants to vote for that, you know? Is it also true, Sarah, that there was more of an evidentiary basis to make those accusations and ultimately indictments um, in a way that uh, Bob Mueller refused to investigate um, and it's not clear if Congress, with the present Supreme Court, will ever have access to the financial records that exposed on the state level someone like the former Governor Greitens. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, Mueller did not look for Trump's tax returns. He did not look that deeply into Deutsche Bank, which is the center of Russian mob laundering, the Jeffrey Epstein case, uh, you know, various arrangements Trump had financially. Uh, you know, it's, it's basically a pathway to a lot of secrets. He also did an interview key parties or indict obvious criminals like Jared Kushner. And the thing is with the Mueller probe is that these are people who confess their crimes. Like Donald Trump doesn't try to hide his association with Russia. He gets out on a stage and says, Russia, will you get me Hillary Clinton's email? And then in 2017, his son, Donald Trump Jr. tweets out incriminating emails about that meeting in Trump Tower. So you're kind of looking at this and you're like, you know, Mueller, this doesn't seem very hard to solve, being that they're constantly telling you about their criminal behavior. Like how in the world could this one take two years and, you know, two lead basically to no results. We had a number of baffling um, decisions made during that probe, like the plea deals for people like Michael Flynn, a very dangerous individual who was working simultaneously for Russia and Turkey and you know, in, involved in all sorts of illicit endeavors. He's a danger to us now walking around free. He got a plea deal, served no time, and now Trump wants to put him back into the administration. Like, how in the world is that justice being served? Right. Well, look, you're, we're going to see this tested now during the campaign, the extent to which Mueller's exoneration, in effect, um, based on his refusal to investigate in his narrow mandate, if you want to call it that. Initially, we thought that that would embolden Donald Trump. Then we had the Ukraine affair and impeachment. And now we're in the midst of this pandemic um, in which the government is failing on any number of levels and that same cacistocracy and corrupt um, modus operandi of government is, is fully in 
in operation. I, I guess my question is, Sarah, is do you think the emboldening of his corruption um, over these many months is, is going to lead him to um, re-election under any circumstance because of what you've documented about his autocratic tendencies that no president has really professed since uh, Andrew Johnson, uh, or maybe Andrew Jackson. So, I mean, it, it's, it's hard to ask this question, but I, I have to, which is, is the corruption going to enable him to be reelected under any circumstance? I mean, I think it's certainly possible, and I would call it more of a reinstallation uh, than a re-election, because I've never thought we were going to have a free and fair election. I think we should try. You know, I think that's why we should have been looking at things like voter suppression, foreign interference, insecure machines all along. It's why we should be pushing for voting by mail now so that they can't exploit the coronavirus crisis to do that. But yeah, he has no intention of leaving. It's not hard to understand what Trump wants. He wants money power and immunity from prosecution. And right now he uses his executive, executive privileges to say that he can't be prosecuted. And people like Mueller accept that. They say, oh, it's, you know, I'm just following pre precedent. Like even though this person is obviously tremendously damaging to our country, he is purging, you know, the FBI uh, at which Mueller worked. He is blatantly committing crimes. I mean, the list of impeachable offenses is just, it's endless. It's emoluments, it's obstruction of justice, it's lying the FBI, it's all sorts of things. Um, and they, they haven't pursued it. So yeah, every time he gets away with the crime, he becomes more emboldened. And every time someone in his circle does, or they walk free, he becomes emboldened as well. And you know, why wouldn't you? It's, it's logical. I mean, it's reprehensible, but it makes sense from his perspective. And there are two ways to view the consequences electorally of the pandemic. One is, you know, you're an expert, not just on the political accountability piece of this, but flyover country about which you've written extensively, um, the heartland, however you wanna, what, what's the best way to refer to these varying states, it's not just Missouri, it's any state in which, you know, the, the, the um, American people are, are more governed by suburb and rural counties than, than metropolises. Um, but, you know, the, the two ways to view it are the pandemic is going to encourage accountability, uh, even if it encourages in the next months uh, further abuses of, of power. But ultimately, the view from flyover country, to quote your first excellent book, is, is, uh, is going to be accountability. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering, based on your experience of the pandemic and in Missouri and elsewhere, where you where you always tweet out beautiful photos of uh, our great country, the heartland. Uh, do you think that accountability on a failed pandemic response is going to transcend some of the conventional party lines in the same way that President Obama was able to win in the heartland, Indiana, uh, close? to winning Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that Biden is capable of that? Um, it's hard to say because what I'm seeing is a weaponization of the pandemic. Um, I think because it disproportionately affected New York and we're seeing all of this uh, really destructive behavior, you know, people thinking of wearing a mask and practicing social distancing as a partisan form of behavior instead of just common sense and public safety. I feel like I'm seeing a microcosm of the national situation living in St. Louis in Missouri because, you know, I live in a metropolitan region of about three million people and that region crosses over between a red and a blue state the quote red state of Missouri and the blue state of Illinois that's all the st. Louis region and you know I, I think that these designations of red and blue are really facetious and you can see it here what we're having happen with our uh, governor is he is quote opening up Missouri liberating Missouri sucking up to Trump not passing any regulations in part because he doesn't want to pay people unemployment but we in st. Louis are still under shelter in place and that kind of mirrors what 
what Trump is doing nationally, where he's saying, yeah, we're all open for business, everything's fine, he's not testing anybody, but cities, um, you know, under their mayors, under their county executives, or what have you, they are under uh, much more restrictive practices. So everywhere we are, we are, you know, seeing different things. And of course, we have great uh, economic inequality in terms of who has to go out, uh, be on the front lines, put themselves in danger. It's often people in service jobs and things like that. And uh, there's also been disproportionate, uh, you know, racial um, suffering in terms of who is most likely to catch this. It's, it's uh, disproportionately affected Black and Native American communities. And so they're weaponizing all of that. I hope that doesn't happen. I mean, this is a time where we as Americans should be coming together. We should be having national mourning. Trump is against that. He won't even lower the flag. That to me is very sad because I'm sad for New York, like from Missouri, and the way I would hope New York would be sad for us if something terrible, you know, were to happen here. Uh, and it, it's really just shameful and sad that we don't have um, that sense of national unity in such a time of crisis. Do you think that the work of the Lincoln Project and the former Republicans who have made the realization that Donald Trump is a mortal threat to our democracy and our way of life, do you think that? That is experienced and felt in a lot of suburban and, and rural homes, and that that will be a crossover effect that even with the paralysis of the underserved communities that you're describing, that that will be so potent as to overcome um, the, the traditional lines of, of demarcation that you're, that you're talking about, uh, red and blue and uh, Republican and Democratic representation. Yeah, I mean, all of those, those boundaries are kind of not as stark as I think folks think they are. And Trump was never as popular uh, in Missouri, you know, or to my knowledge in other states as people think that he is. I often hear this 40% of people like him figure bandied about. There's really no substance for that. His voters are not his base. And a lot of people feel disillusioned, feel let down, feel betrayed uh, by the way that this administration has run. You know, I've talked to Trump voters who paradoxically thought that they were voting for stability. They thought they were voting for some kind of strong man who was going to take away, um, you know, the dire circumstances and uncertainty of their lives. And instead, it's just gotten more and more chaotic. I don't know if, you know, that group or that ad is really the thing that'll do it, because I think people knew this on their own already. Um, but that's why I'm much more worried about the integrity of the election and Trump conceding than I am about Biden or, you know, if something happens and there's some other Democrat. Um, you know, I think any of the Democrats honestly would win over Trump in a free and fair election because I think he's generally widely uh, disliked. The problem is I don't think we're going to have a free and fair election, and I don't think that folks are taking the steps necessary to ensure that, and it's become even more challenging with the pandemic. And you can check out our recent interviews on voting rights during the pandemic on the Open Mind podcast. Uh, one of our most recent conversations was with Ned Foley, who's an expert on disputed elections, and game played that situation with us. Uh, before I let you go, Sarah, you are in Missouri, Missouri, uh, tomato, tomato. Uh, and, uh, and so I don't know if Seth Myers talked to you about this off camera. You were recently on with Seth, um, the intersection of our politics and entertainment for those who view the show Ozarks on Netflix. It certainly gets into a whiff of impropriety, corruption, illicit behavior, uh, intersecting with Illinois, your home state, and, uh, and, and this part of the heartland. Did, uh, I haven't asked you before, and I haven't seen you tweet about it, so I wanted to give you an open forum to comment on An uh, how, how realistic a portrait that is of the mainstreaming of corruption in our political process. Well, or no it, spoilers, no spoilers. I've seen yeah. season one, I thought it was great. I started watching season two, but I was writing Hiding Plain Sight when it came out, and I was like, I can't take this anymore. I can't write about Eric Brighton's and watch this show. It's like too much. I have no relief. So I'm planning to get back to it. I heard season three uh, is even better. I do think it's a good show. I was worried it was going to, you know, traffic and stereotypes um, about Missouri. But, you know, I go down to the lake and it really is a wide variety of people. And there is, uh, you know, quite a bit of, of criminality and corruption as well as, you know, many good people uh, in Missouri. I, I think Missouri was silly to not let the show uh, film here. You know, we could be making, you know, quite a bit of money uh, with that and uh, just another uh, name decision from our government. 
Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to get back to that now that the book is done and I could get some uh, entertaining relief. And, and folks can, of course, download it uh, through electronic means. Um, they can listen to it, I'm sure, in time if it's not already av available as an audio. The book, you mean? Uh, book, uh, yeah, yeah, it's available hardcover, ebook, audible, like any format you want. Was, and just to close, you know, I, I did want to ask you, because your subject so much overlaps with our guest Tom Nichols um, a couple of years ago, you know, when, when you see hiding in plain sight and, and sort of want to just impart some uh, wisdom to viewers who are going to look at your book, uh, do you see it more as uh, up is down or up is nothing um, in the sense of, you know, the, the kind of conundrum, is it more Orwell or Huxley that we're living through right now? So is up down or is up nothing? It, it's a combination. <laughs> I mean, I think that we are experiencing a genuine transition, uh, you know, into autocracy in which we're losing many of our rights, we're losing many of our constitutional protections. Uh, we also have incredible propaganda, double speak, big brother, surveillance society, what have you. We are also, uh, you know, entertaining ourselves to death. I think that people are lulled by a media system that is much more an infotainment system than an actual, um, you know, thorough telling of truth. Uh, that kind of, um, you know, system came into play uh, in the 90s with reality television and cable news. Trump is very, very skillful at navigating that new kind of media system, and he always has been. And I think that that is one of the reasons he gets away with the amount of crimes that he does, because people just see them as scandals. And, you know, they'll talk about them for about 48 hours. There are no consequences, and then they drift away. But these are serious offenses, and people should take them seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate your time. Uh, please, our viewers, go take a look at Hiding in Plain Sight. Congratulations on the book and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash Open Mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, The Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, The John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.